Well, hi everyone. Ken Ham here, CEO of Answers in Genesis Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, along with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. He has a PhD from Harvard University in biology. And Dr. Jensen has been doing a lot of study in history because of his study in genetics and bringing them all together. You know, one of the things, Nathaniel, that I have done over the years is made sure that we position Answers in Genesis as not just a ministry about creation, evolution, and the age of the earth and fossils. It's a biblical authority ministry, an evangelistic ministry, but a biblical authority ministry. That's how I've always positioned this ministry. Because really, what we're doing is to getting people to take the Bible seriously from the very beginning. And, you know, we've been emphasizing that in biology and geology and astronomy and anthropology. And what you're saying is we need to do that also in its history, its genealogies, looking at the history of civilizations, and you're bringing the science of genetics and that history uh, together. And so in this particular episode, which you've entitled Neglected Biblical Clues to Ancient History, in other words, I'm guessing from the description you gave me that you're gonna be looking at the text and saying, look what the text says. If you take this seriously, you have to rethink certain things about what we see about uh, different civilizations. And so I'm going to hand over to you and let you take it from here and we'll sum up at the end and uh, see what happens. Very good. And I want to give cautions at the outset again and encourage all our viewers to be Bereans. When we discuss the text of scripture, especially in Christian circles. This is often a point of contention. And if you've been a follower of Answers in Genesis for a long time, you should know the right approach and the wrong approach, especially that eisegesis, exegesis terms. How often do we hear people say, well, science says, and therefore we need to reinterpret the text of scripture, eisegesis, reading things into the text instead of reading the Bible and viewing the world through that lens. Exegesis is letting the text speak for itself, comparing scripture with scripture, and then viewing the world through that lens. Well, I'm going to talk about today some of the some of the other biblical clues I've missed going along in the text that then change the way I view the world and events we see in the Bible that leave echoes in our DNA. But all that's to come momentarily. We've been focusing in early episodes on the relationships among living peoples today. We're getting now closer and closer to the relationship between ancient cultures and the very first cultures, post-flood cultures and you and I. Could there be relationships we've missed before? Now for me personally, what I'm gonna to describe today has its origins, more immediate origins, in 2015. Back then I initiated a collaboration with a linguist from Wycliffe Bible Translators. At that time I had been doing work on mitochondrial DNA, which is just the technical term for the DNA inherited through the maternal line. And if you followed previous episodes and the work we've done in Answers in Genesis, we, you know we've talked about the signature of the three wives of Noah's sons showing up in DNA, the echo of the biblical account. So that's, that was published, done. I thought, well, let's, let's keep going in the biblical text and look for the next major biblical event after the flood, which would be Babel, Genesis 10, Genesis 11. Can we see the signature of Babel? And my thought was, this is a primarily linguistic event. The cause effect is... God confuses the languages, that's the cause, yet the effect's gonna, there's gonna be a profound genetic signature, surely. So I said and asked him to work with me to say, can we find an overlap between the genetic map of humanity, which is what we see here in this slide, and the linguistic map of humanity. So I was looking at the, the maternally inherited DNA, the, the, the family tree based on that, and the isolation or mixing of various lineages and trying to create a map of humanity and seeing if we could see parallels. Well, we found a lot of disagreement. And the disagreement is what led to some major discoveries and actually much of the history we've been discussing in previous episodes. And it also forced me to go back and read the Bible with a closer eye and in more detail and more depth. Again. I think I'm saying you should view with suspicion because I would view it with suspicion. Anytime someone says, ah, there's something we've missed in the Bible. Uh-huh. You think this late stage in history, we've been missing this all along? 
So there, you should view this with suspicion. However, another thing I've had to remember is we're all fallible human beings. We're finite, and the infinite God has condescended to us, given us his word, which is a gigantic book that takes a lifetime to master. And oftentimes it's sin that keeps us from seeing things in scripture. I can think of my own life, and I've missed the beauty of holiness for many years because I've been enslaved to pornography in times past and, and not wanting to see things the Bible says. So there's that aspect too, and the Bible teaches that. So we're going to compare scripture with scripture, and I think we'll see some clues that I've neglected in times past that have big implications for how we look at the history of humanity and also lead to other confirmations of what the text says. This is now episode 20. I'll review very quickly, just in case some have not viewed the earlier ones, what's come before. Episode one, we looked at the history of people, the history of human population growth, to see that the world is a lot smaller than we think. Politics and peoples are two very different entities. There's overlap, but there's different histories and different implications. Episode two, we, we reached a similar conclusion, looking at the math of how many ancestors each of us have in our family trees, and to see connections we didn't expect to exist. Episodes three and four looked at ethnic change. We all have stereotypes about how fast or slow so-called races can change. We're all various shades of brown, but we still have this idea that we're all so different and it takes a long time. No, it can happen very fast. And your ancestry can be very different than you think. You have the genetics of racial change, ethnic change, combined with slight differences in reproductive rates. One family is two kids, one family is one. And this can have dramatic consequences within a few hundred years, episodes three and four. Episodes five and six form the foundation for all we've been discussing since. We saw that there's clocks within each of our bodies, marking off the passage of time, the passage of generations. And it's the male inherited DNA for technical reasons we discussed in those episodes. The Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA, that's the key to human history. And this is a history you will not get through Family Tree DNA, Ancestry.com, any of these commercial genetic testing companies, because they have the mainstream time scale, the real hero of the plot in all of this we've been discussing is the biblical time scale. You don't see these echoes of history. You don't see the smoking gun of human history unless you have the biblical time scale. And this is, this is a big shift for many years. People in the apologetic creation evolution debate have viewed, and I've had the same view for a while, viewed the age of the earth question as a geological astronomical question. It has little to do with biology. So you can have old earth creationists we can, we can fight evolution, biological evolution, but let's not disagree about the time scale. I'm sorry, now you can't do that anymore. There's profound echoes of the time scale in biology. You have to take a position. Applying this tree then to the question of human history, we've seen lost relatives of Europe in episode seven, connections to India we didn't think possible. In the recent past, the explanation seems to be the Mongol Empire and its aftermath, episode, episode eight. There's Chinese connections to Europe we didn't think were present, episode nine. We looked at the history of Western Europe and the Americas, episode 10, to see a hidden history we didn't think was present before. There's a, there's a recent Central Asian connection for the majority of Western Europe and Caucasian Americas. Pre-Columbian Americas is where we looked at episode 11, beginning episode 11, a revolution in mainstream archaeology. So many of our stereotypes have changed. We, we saw applying this family tree of humanity to the question of the pre-Columbian Americas, a shocking find. The Americas were resettled at least once. The today's Native Americans were not the first Native Americans. And it may be the Native Americans themselves who recorded this, episode 13. The Mayans, their downfall, one of the great unsolved mysteries of archaeology, may be due to this invasion that we see now in genetics and the invasion we see only in the context of the 4,500-year time scale from the Bible. There's connections between Native Americans, today's Native Americans, and Europe that passed through Central Asia, episode 15. Who were the first Native Americans? The first Americans, could they have connection to the Pacific, to the Australian Aborigines? That's what we looked at in episode 16. We returned to Europe in episode 17 to look at the Vikings and other early European peoples and why they are not the dominant group today and may have something to do with the Black Death. Episode 18, we began to look at the Middle East and the Jews specifically and saw that the dominant Jewish lineage, that's what it's been called in mainstream science, is probably not Jewish in origin. We'll return to the Jewish question in future episodes. We looked at the ancient Egyptians and Africa, sub-Saharan Africa as well, and the connections between the two, who would have connected them in the first millennium before Christ. We saw that episode 19. Well, today we're going to look at neglected biblical clues to ancient history. And just to get our bearings, to orient ourselves with the familiar before we get to the unfamiliar, 
let's go to the seven C's of history, which is a tremendous helpful tool for getting the broad, big picture scope of the history of the universe and the major points of departure from mainstream science and evolution, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. You have the beginning of all things in Genesis 1, creation, the traumatic fall of mankind, corruption, flood, catastrophe, confusion at Babel, and then the gospel, Christ, cross, consummation, the future hope for believers. So just to explore this then in the context of human history and anthropology, creation, as it relates to human history, is God creating the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, not from primates and evolving them over millions of years, but in six days, about 6,000 years ago, and creating them perfect, without sin, and free from corruption. That changes in Genesis chapter 3, when God curses the ground because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. And, and, and death follows, both human death and animal death. And this, of course, is a gigantic contradiction to those who hold and try to synthesize mainstream science, evolution with the Bible. Evolution is built on the survival of the fittest, death and destruction of the unfit, which happens in mainstream science for millions of years before humans arrive on the scene. That's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. And of course, the gospel is that the most fit, Jesus Christ, comes and dies for you and me, the unfit. So the whole narrative direction of the Bible is reversed if you try to synthesize and harmonize, so-called harmonize evolution with the Bible. It doesn't work. Catastrophe. Sin grows so pervasive and global that God judges the planet and reduces the human population size, which had been growing, to just eight. Four men, four women. Genesis 9 says, as we're thinking about human history, that from these three boys, and by implication their wives, these three couples, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole earth was repopulated. So that means the Y chromosomes that we have today come from Noah and his family, and specifically those three boys. This text seems to refute the idea that there may have been other children, other descendants of Noah and his wife after the flood. It's these three couples that are our ancestors. Well, sin returns. The depraved human nature of mankind rears its ugly head in short order after the flood. The whole earth, Genesis 11, was one language and one speech, but instead of spreading out like God commanded, the people decided to try to build a tower to heaven. And God judged that and forced that tower to stop being built and forced the people to scatter by confusing the languages. It's pretty hard to work on a gigantic pyramid or other such tower when you can't talk to the guy next to you. So this is what we've rightly viewed as the impetus to the formation of the major ethno-linguistic groups that we see today. Now in 2015, as I mentioned, I was working on this mitochondrial DNA, this, this DNA inherited from moms. So the three boys of Noah and his family would have inherited their mitochondrial DNA from their wives, but Mrs. Noah's lineage would have stopped with the three boys because the boys don't pass it on. I have my mother's, but my four children have my wife's which means then our mitochondrial DNA comes from the three wives of Noah's sons. Were they sisters? Were they daughters of Noah and Mrs. Noah? I don't see much in the text that implies that. And intriguingly, we've seen these three ancient major groupings of mitochondrial DNA, maternally inherited DNA, in the global human family tree. Could this be the echo of the flood? That's what I thought in 2015, so I thought let's take it the next step further. After the flood, these three wives of Noah's sons, comes Babel and dispersion of peoples. So could we see an overlap between the genetic map of humanity and, and the linguistic map? And as I mentioned, we found many points of contradiction, which gave me pause for some time until the light bulb finally went on. So I'm going to highlight, to be able to highlight more clearly the discoveries we made. I'm going I'm to darken this map so you can still see in, in various shades of gray the major linguistic families, and then show you the, the genetic implications. So where we did find overlap was in those regions of the world that have, in, in my mind at that, then, at that point in time, were the most isolated regions of the world. So linguistically, you've got families here in Australia, Papua New Guinea. Genetically, look at maternally inherited DNA. These were some of the most isolated ancient lineages on the planet. In places where there's a long history of fighting, conquest, violence, rape, pillage, and murder, constant conflict in the Middle East, so forth, as an example, we saw disagreement. Now, a light bulb finally went on at some point 
which when I tell you it, you're going to say, well, of course, why didn't you think of that before? That's kind of what we thought. Why didn't we think of this before? But <laughs> this is how it went. One of the key light bulbs for me, and which makes tremendous sense in retrospect, came from looking at Africa. So linguistically, we've talked about this previously, especially in the last episode, there's these major language families in Africa. Afro-Asiatic, which I'm saying is probably due to the, the, the geographic extent of it, is probably due to the, the recent, more recent Muslim conquest. You've got Nilo Saharan, Niger Congo in green, Khoisan in lime green, and then the light, the, this teal green down here in South Africa due to the European migrations during the age of exploration. Okay, why do I bring this up? Well, genetically, you can see lineages in Africa that connect to the New World. Why is that? Go back to the language map. You can see these languages of Africa do not exist in the Americas. Sure, you've got Indo-European languages in South Africa, and you've got this, this teal green also in the Americas, and also in Europe. You speak English in the US, Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America. You don't see Niger Congo spoken in the Americas. You don't see Afro-Asiatic spoken in the Americas, except for recent African immigrants, Middle Eastern immigrants. You don't see a linguistic overlap, by and large, between the Americas and, the, and Africa, but you do see a genetic connection. Why is that? Well, the sad explanation is the transatlantic slave trade. And the resolution to our little dilemma is straightforward. You can change your language. You can't change your DNA. The people who were forced onto the slave ships spoke these African languages. But as they were forced onto plantations in the New World and their descendants grew up in English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, Portuguese-speaking cultures, they learned these languages and grew up speaking them. But their genetic history, embedded in their DNA, reflected their African origins. Well, of course, you can change your language. You can't change your DNA. Why didn't you think of that sooner? Well, that's what we thought. Why didn't we think of this sooner? That began to resolve some of these discrepancies. It also forced me to go back and look at the scriptures anew. And it's right to think about the seven seas of history. There's seven days of creation. It's a great number to think of. It's a great overview of history. This forced me to go back and look more carefully at other, perhaps smaller events in the text that fill out some of the details within this larger framework of the seven seas. So let's go back to the text and see what it actually says. If you start with Genesis 11 and 10, as I did, you might be tempted to go looking for a Semitic line. Well, let's see what the Bible says about the Semitic line beginning in Genesis 12, one chapter later. Genesis 12, Abraham, in the line of Shem, in the line of the Eber, the Hebrew peoples, Abraham, because of a famine, goes down to Egypt, which is the Hamitic line. And it were not for the divine intervention of God, there would be mixing between the Semitic and Hamitic lines at the very earliest stages. Sarah was taken into Pharaoh's house and would have been his wife because Abraham told her to lie and say, this is my sister. Well, God intervened and nothing happened. Sarah was returned to Abraham. Sarai was returned to Abraham. But that wasn't the only event that happened in Egypt. Abraham brought with them, perhaps due to that migration down and back out, an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And of course, famously, infamously, Abraham fathers a child via Hagar Ishmael which many view then as the long-standing explanation for the conflict between the Jews and the Arabs to this day. My point is, there's mixing between Hamitic and Semitic lines at the very earliest stages of human history. And this is from the Bible, not from science. This is from the Bible itself. Fast forward just a few generations, Genesis 41. Joseph is in Egypt. And what I want us to notice here is that his wife is an Egyptian. And if you think further forward in Israel, Israel's history, you'll know that Joseph's two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, become part of the 12 tribes of Israel and Canaan. Those two whole tribes of Israel have as their mother an Egyptian. Of course, Jacob's whole family comes to Egypt. Pharaoh sends these carts, they carry him down, they multiply in Egypt, Joseph and his family. Fast forward into the book of Exodus after hundreds of years of slavery. Depending on your view of short or long sojourn, they're there quite some time. And they come out of Egypt with 600,000 men plus women and children, but not just Israelites, 
a mixed multitude comes up with him. Who, who were these people? Were they of the Hamitic line? Were they of a different line? There's mixing at these earliest stages in Israel's history. And it doesn't stop there. Before they ever get to Canaan, the people fall into sin, commit harlotry with the women of Moab. So how many peoples in the Middle East were running around at points in time thereafter of mixed Moabite, Israelite ancestry? They get to the land of Canaan. They're commanded to wipe out the Canaanites. And of course, infamously, many of the tribes failed to do so. Judges chapter one, who will go up and fight against the Canaanites? Well, Manasseh did not drive out the Canaanites. They, they failed to obey this commandment. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Zebulun did not drive out the Canaanites. Naphtali did not drive out the Canaanites. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. So even Israel here, they're in the promised land and they're dwelling among and perhaps intermixing with the peoples of the land. The Semitic line doesn't stay a Semitic line necessarily. King Solomon marries women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, in huge numbers. He has 700 wives, 300 concubines. How many Israelites in later generations of the Israelite monarchy are running around being of mixed ethnic ancestry? Then, of course, the monarchy falls, the northern tribes carried away to Assyria, part of the beginnings of the Jewish diaspora. And I say Jewish, knowing that we've just discussed all sorts of mix mixing prior to this. The southern tribes fall twice to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, initial conquest, carries people off into captivity. He leaves some, though, the poorest of the land stay, they get conquered again. Nebuzaradan carries away captive people who remain to the king of Babylon, leaves some of the poor of the land. Yet even some of these people go a different direction. All the people, small and great, arose and went to Egypt. Jeremiah records the same event. Johanan, the son of Kareah, and the captains of the forces, would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah, but took all the remnant of Judah, who had returned to dwell in the land of Judah, went to the land of Egypt. And this is all before the time of Christ. And this is straight from the text. This is not throwing in science. This is what the Bible says about the history of the Semitic line. And of course, they get conquered by Rome, Greece, so forth. This is from the Arch of Titus, them celebrating the conquest, the sack of Jerusalem around the time of Christ. My point is this. If you've been around Jewish people today, you know, there's long-standing traditions of maintaining Jewishness. My time spent in Boston around Jewish people. Grew up, be a lawyer, a doctor, marry a good Jewish girl. Still to this day, there's this tradition. Well, if you look at the biblical history, among these peoples who have strong religious traditional reasons to stay within their group and to marry people within their group, if you have people like this, who despite all this basis and reason for staying ethnically pure, so to speak, if they have all these reasons to do so, yet they're still intermixed and conquered and moved among and within groups around the globe or groups wider than just their local Israelite community. How much more so would this be true for everyone else around the globe who does not have traditional cultural reasons to stay marrying within their group? If this is what happens to Israel, who has much reason to stay within their group, yet they still get conquered, how much more so will this rule of thumb be true around the globe? That's my point. And this is from the Bible. So I want to add to this broad overview a specific point that I think is relevant. One, you're trying to answer the question of human history, which is what we're trying to do in this series. From the Bible, I want to add to our C's, conquest. So this is, I think, the naive mistake I made going into the study with a linguist. Let's look for the echo of Babel. Well, if you just read forward in the Bible, you know it's Babel plus thousands of years of conquest and intermixing just from the history of Israel. So you might say, well, at this point, well, okay, if, if, if you have to think about human history as the flood and then Babel, and lots of conquest, is it still valid to talk about the genetic echo of the three wives of Noah's sons. If Babel is obscured by thousands of years of violence and carrying people away from their homelands, planting them among other peoples, 
Should we expect to see this echo? I think this is probably still a legitimate signature, given the evidence we have so far. But it's worth thinking about it critically going forward. What about the Y chromosome, though? Is it legitimate to think about tracing our ancestry through these three boys and back to Noah? Yes, of course, biblically it is. The question, though, is should we expect to find that signature to this day? Yes, these are ancient real events, but have they been obscured by all this other mixing since then? Well, let's take a look. I've mentioned frequently in previous episodes that there's a question about where exactly Noah is in this tree. We're going to look at that now in more depth and the reasons why he may be here versus there, and where future research will hopefully resolve this. Now, I've said Noah is going to be somewhere around here. Now, we're sort of zoomed out, so it's hard to see exactly what I mean. I'm going to say he could be up here, and you might say, well, I thought you said down here. Well, yes, it's vertically higher. What matters here, though, is that time moves from left to right. So this point up here is not that far removed from back here. We're still sort of talking about this, this horizontal position from left to right, ancient, Recent, this is still very ancient history. Could Noah be up here? Could he be right here where I've been saying, or down here? It may be hard to see what I'm talking about. We're gonna zoom in here momentarily. Let's start with that, that upper one. If you were to zoom in on this part of the tree, you'd find a triad structure. So if you're thinking about Noah having three boys, and these three boys being at the fountainhead of the entire human race, that's a good place to start. Could this be the signature of the the lineage of uh, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Well, if you use that point as the starting point for humanity, and then you try to reconstruct the history of human population growth as a way to test whether or not it matches geology, excuse me, archaeology and, and written history, it matches quite well. You might say, well, isn't that the graph you showed earlier? And <laughs> there's good reason to be forgiven for thinking so, because we'll see momentarily that the match between Y chromosome history and human history is really good at multiple points in this tree. So let me show you what I mean. So if you drew Noah at that upper portion, you get a good match between the tan lines and the blue. Blue is what we know from archaeology and from, from written history. I've started it at 1000 BC because from that point forward, there is lots of overlap between mainstream science and what the Bible says. Even mainstream people who don't believe the Bible will acknowledge, yes, David existed around 1000 BC. They'll deny the Exodus. 1000 BC, but from this point going forward, fine, we'll acknowledge that the Bible is probably right, <laughs> begrudgingly. So that's why I'm using a mainstream science as a, as a way to test the history of human population growth. Well, what about this position down here? Once again, you can find this position in the tree, a triad structure, which again, if you're looking for Noah and his three boys, that's the type of thing you're going to want to look for. If you reconstruct human population growth, again, you get a great match. You might say, well, what's the difference? From 1000 BC going forward, there's lots of overlap. The real differences, as you might expect from these various points in the tree, deal with the pre-1000 BC history. So let me just show you side by side. That's the history from that lower point of the tree. You compare it to the upper point of the tree, and it looks like this. So you can see the shape here is slightly different back here versus, if you draw Noah down here, it's, it's flatter. Well, if you know, draw Noah where I've been drawing him, put him right here, you get a little different answer. Number one, you get two major branches that come out. You might say, hold on, why would you even consider the position for Noah in the tree where there's only two branches? We'll get to that momentarily. So is that Shem and Ham? Did, are, we, are we missing Japheth? Why would you even consider that? Again, from the, from the overlap, there's... Once again, lots of overlap. There's, there's differences back here. We'll get to those differences back there momentarily, again, to put it side by side, where there's a three-pronged structure. Back here looks like this. It kind of comes upward and it's fairly slow growth. If you put them down low, it's fairly flat, then it starts growing. In fact, if you put them down here, it implies there's hardly any growth. And, and the lineages don't diversify around the globe until about 1200 BC. So that doesn't make much sense to me, where it's almost like there's a Babel event in 1200 BC. I don't see any good biblical reason to think that. So that's part of the reason I haven't used that lineage. Uh, this one down here, though, that I just mentioned, where there's two branches coming off of what I'm calling Noah, has a good match. Well, why would I even consider this? Well, let's go back to the text of Scripture. Another potential C, another detail to add to this broad overview. 
And I'm going to go to an early biblical event around the time of Joseph, Genesis chapter 41. You might recall that Joseph is given a coat of many colors. His brothers are jealous of him. The text says this repeatedly, how angry they are with him. And they send him. They nearly kill him. They sell him to slave traders who take him to Egypt. He's brought into Potiphar's house. He's falsely accused of abusing his master's wife, sent into prison, rots in prison for two years, interprets the dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants. They forget about him. One is killed, one is restored. And finally, two years later, several years later, the servant of Pharaoh, after Pharaoh has a dream, says, oh, I remember this guy, there was this, this, this Jewish guy in prison who could interpret dreams. You should haul him out and interpret your dream. That's several chapters of Genesis history in a nutshell. So then Joseph gets, gets hauled out of prison, brought before Pharaoh, and, and Joseph says to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. He interprets and tells Pharaoh his dream. He says the, the, the heads of grain and the, the fat and skinny cows, seven years of plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt. After that, seven years of famine. And all the plenty of the land will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will deplete the land. And if you know the rest of the story, all the way down to Genesis 50, there's a larger theological purpose in all this. Joseph, who has been done tremendous injustice by his brothers, comes to recognize, through God's divine providence, that it's God who's sent him to Egypt because there's this famine coming, and God sends Joseph to Egypt. So, so while so if you look at Genesis 50, while you were plotting evil, God was intending good. The text is revolutionary and strong. He's saying that while you were enslaving me, God was intending a great purpose of saving you. God made a promise to Abraham, and he keeps that promise by preserving Jacob's family in Egypt through this injustice. God is not the author of evil. It's, there's profound theological things going on here in the text. Well, in this theological rescue of God's people, there is some profound implications for human history. This is, this is real history with profound theological implications. It has profound practical implications for how we think about human history. That's what I'm going to argue. So Joseph said the famine is going to be severe. Pharaoh promotes him to second in command to take charge of preserving peoples through this famine. So he stores up lots of grain. Well, watch what happens in the text. Verse 53 of Genesis 41. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all, all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Now, I wanted to read that in one sitting so you could see the sweep of the passage, but I want to go back to it and emphasize certain phrases that I think are significant. Notice with me, the famine was in all lands. There's four instances of what sound like, to me, global phrases. And there's a couple of reasons why I think they're global. First of all, as creationists, so if you're watching as a creationist, that's what I'm saying, us as creationists, we've been reading Genesis 6, 7, 8, 11, as global, when it says all the earth was covered, all the earth was one language, one speech, we've taken that as global, plain, global. Why wouldn't we be consistent and take this as global? And I realize, even among conservative commentators, they may not say that. Well, isn't this regional? Isn't this Egypt and Canaan? I mean, why would you say this is the globe? It raises lots of questions. But before we think about science, let's just take the text straightforward. Famine was in all lands, first instance. Famine was over all the face of the earth, second instance. All countries, all lands, third instance, fourth instance. Well, what's the Hebrew? I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I can use a concordant and say, what's the Hebrew word? And I've been working with some folks who have better knowledge of Hebrew. Well, the word in each of these cases that's translated various ways in English is the word Eretz. The famine was in all Eretz, translated as lands. Famine was over all the face of the Eretz, earth. Famine in all countries, Eretz, same word again, all lands, Eretz. So it's the same Hebrew word in each case. What I find interesting is there seems to be a formula in this passage for separating local from global. What do I mean? Well, when the author wants to talk about 
the land of Egypt, it's the Eretz of Egypt. It seems to be when the author wants to say, we're talking about this local area, he says Eretz of, and then designates the local area, the Eretz of Canaan, the Eretz of Egypt. But when he wants to talk global, he just says all Eretz. That's what seems to be the straightforward interpretation of this passage. I realize it's as many troubling implications perhaps for archeology, span for history, but this to me, I think is what the, the plain reading is. And I realize there's many who might disagree, but this is what I wanna work with for the time being. Where does this lead? I think that's a straightforward interpretation. Again, maybe some controversy about it, but that to me, if you take the Bible at face value, read it consistently in context, that seems to be what it implies. Now, again, I, re I recognize, well, what about, what about the Americas? What about Papua New Guinea? What about Australia? How could all these countries and lands come to Egypt? Hold on, that's extra biblical data. Let's get to that momentarily. Let's not let science dictate the text. Let's let the text dictate science. Let's answer the next question that arises textually. When did this happen? If you add up the genealogies and such in the text, this is about six to 700 years post-flood. Why do I bring that up? For a couple of reasons. Number one, I've been in discussions with Mike Ord, who's got a model of the Ice Age, and there are many models of the Ice Age within the Young Earth Creationist community. I'm not here to arbitrate which one is right and which one's wrong. What I found intriguing is he told me that in his Ice Age model, six to 700 years post-flood is when he sees global drought. I can't think of a better cause for a global famine than a global drought. So could this be an echo of the Ice Age? I don't know, but I find that correlation intriguing. Is there a global effect here because there's a global Ice Age that's going on? We're talking about genetics though. So let's think about this implication for human history and the intertwining of genetic lineages. If it's true that all lands, all countries come to Egypt, even peoples of the Americas. Now what I'm gonna show you is there may not have been peoples in the Americas at this point in time. We'll see, we'll get to that eventually. But if there's multiple ethnicities returning to Egypt, could there have been intermixing? Well, let's think about what this might mean, what, what it might not mean. Does this mean that every single person alive comes to Egypt? I'd say textually, not necessarily, because initially Jacob doesn't come to Egypt. Jacob sends his sons, and not all of his sons. He desperately wants to keep Benjamin with him. Of course, that's a major event in the text, getting and prying Benjamin from him because he's, he's lost Joseph, he doesn't want to lose Benjamin too. And of course, then he discovers Joseph has been alive. That's a significant event in this text. So it could be that many of these cultures and ancient tribes and peoples sent representatives to Egypt and the majority of the people stayed back home. Go get grain and bring it back. That could have happened. There's biblical reasons for thinking it so. Jacob comes to Egypt after he finds out it's Joseph who's ruling. Oh, my son is here, so you know, come and live with us. It could be that some peoples sent representatives. Some of them stayed, and those people who were far away died out. It depends on what they decided to do. There, there's a lot of potential scenarios here. My point is the text talks about all lands, and one of those lands in the land of Canaan, Jacob sends representatives. Eventually, they all come. So there's potential here for mixing. That's my point. It talks about all lands. It seems to be a global phrase. And I'm taking this slowly and carefully because this, this is not something I'm used to thinking about and perhaps many of our re viewers are not used to thinking about. So back to this controversial position for Noah where there's only two lineages coming on. Well, at the point at which those two lineages come off, uh, you see there's, there's basically a blank line here. This is the actual tree. There's not other lineages coming off. Multiple lineages all across the globe start coming off at this tip right here. So there's, if you put Noah right here, there's a, there's a time period where there's not ethnic diversification. And then at this point, there is ethnic diversification. This is a family tree in which we can put calendar dates. Well, the point at which multiple lineages start diversifying, Papua New Guinea, China, India, Europe, Africa, happens to be in this tree at a point in time that overlaps the timing of Joseph's famine. So could this be an echo of it? 
Well, what about Japheth or Ham? Who's mixing? Who's missing? We'll talk about the math of this family tree momentarily. We've seen that human history, biblical history, is conquest. You might have noticed, if you read and, and tabulate Genesis 10 carefully, two of the lines, and I think it's Shem and Ham, have twice as many descendants in Genesis 10 as Japheth does. And if conquest is the rule from Abraham going forward, could it have been the rule from Babel going forward? God diversifies them. They're sinners. He's diversifying them, forcing them to spread out because they've sinned. What's to make us think, especially if you've got someone like Nimrod in Genesis 10, who's called a mighty hunter, what's to stop them from starting to kill each other early on? Could some of those lines have gone extinct? And this is not me trying to speculate something wild and crazy. We've seen from the text itself, people start conquering early on. There's mixing in Egypt. And it doesn't have to be violent conquest. It could simply be different differential rates of reproduction. There may still be a Japheth line out there that we haven't yet discovered. Again, this is math we'll get into in subsequent episodes. There's some algebra we have to do and so forth. My point is, from the text itself, there's a long history of con conquest after Babel. And I want to add in another C here that could have potential genetic significance. I'm going to call it caravan. Seven seeds of creation give us the broad overview of history. If we want to dig down into the details, I think this is, from the text itself, two key parameters we have to keep in mind because they may leave signatures in archaeology. <clears throat> they may leave signatures in genetics. And we may, in fact, see the signature of caravan, depending on where we put Noah. So I've given you three major positions where Noah might be. I've been using one particular position, the one that's consistent with caravan for the duration of our series. But again, given the caveat, Noah might be elsewhere. More genetic research could bear this out. What I wanted to highlight here is there are these strong biblical parameters we need to keep in mind when thinking about human history. And we need to view the science through the lens of scripture. So when we get to these most ancient time periods, which we'll do next week, we're going to take a pretty big sledgehammer to mainstream archaeology. We're going to take a sledgehammer to mainstream linguistics. And both of these together inform mainstream history. But it's appropriate because we should start with scripture when viewing the science, and we should recognize the unbiblical assumptions people take into their research. What I also want you to see is that even though we're introducing things that may seem new, these were new to me, this is not oh, we've taken science and reinterpreted scripture. It's no, we've read scripture more carefully. It's a big book. And it's a lifetime of study. There's events I missed, and didn't pay attention to, that may in fact have an echo in genetics if we're looking carefully. Now, I've drawn this this way because history of the Bible has strong theological implications. Perfection, corruption, major sin that's judged, more major sin that's judged, the famine, and of course, descent into Chaos really is what human history is. Divinely constrained and guided chaos, but sinful man has been slaughtering and pillaging fellow man for as long as we've been thinking. So is it appropriate to call the biblical history the descent of man, the descent of man into more and more sin, which is why we need a savior? Here's the history of mankind. Now, I've already highlighted some of the burning questions I'm sure, sure our viewers have. Well, what about after Babel before famine? What about the Americas? How can you explain what you've just said in, in light of the Americas at the earliest stages? Well, we'll get to that because the lens I've just given you has a profound implication for how we date these ancient events, the Neanderthals, the first Americans, the Guineans, and we'll do that in future episodes of the New History of the Human Race. So I hope you'll join us next time as we begin to rewrite some of the earliest episodes of human history through the lens of scripture, which then guides our genetic discussion. Dr. Jensen, uh, we're up to number 20, 21 and 22 next week. Seems like these are going on for millions of years, but uh, we don't believe in millions of years. You know, I was just thinking that there's a lot of people who have said, you can't be right about the flood of Noah and about taking the Bible, you know, as written because Egyptian history goes back dating it from the way it's dated in the secular world beyond the date of the flood that we, 
would take from scripture. And so this is very important to help people understand secular archaeology. I mean, those dates are just not right. And they need to be all rewritten, which is what you're doing. You're rewriting history. That means when you go to a lot of the museums that have archaeological artifacts and have those dates on them, those dates, probably in most instances, are just not correct. And it, it's only when you take God at his word and the timeline from scripture that we have a basis for then looking at what we see today and realizing it has to and does fit into the biblical timeline. And of course, you're also adding in genetics at the same time with the Y chromosome research. So absolutely uh, fascinating. And if people want to see all 20 episodes, they can go to answers.tv. That's our streaming service. And our streaming service is very, very inexpensive. For a whole year subscription, it's just over $3 a month. You can go and get a seven day free trial to start with. But it's not just a series by Dr. Jeanson, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos by our speakers and by others as well. And Ray Comfort from Living Waters and programs for kids and music programs and Spanish programs it is a very unique streaming service for the Christian world and for the non-Christian world too. They can get wholesome teaching on their fascinating information and nature programs using uh, Peter Schreimer and then others who are doing programs with our zoo animals. It's just absolutely uh, fascinating. You can also go to our YouTube channel, Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, but people love the answers.tv because it's so easy to find and use and it's all put there together and uh, just a, a powerful, powerful streaming service. So real quickly, before we close this one, next week, 21, 22, what are the subjects? 21, we'll look at what happened to the Neanderthals and we'll, we'll begin, we'll discover that using genetics, we have a method by which we can convert some of these carbon-14, these radiometric dates, the biblical time scale in a way I wouldn't have expected, many of our viewers probably wouldn't have expected. And then in 22, we'll look at searching for Abraham's DNA and looking for the echoes of some of these ancient cultures, questions we can answer, and questions future research will hopefully uncover. So this is all coming up, episode 21 and 22. Okay, uh, we look forward to those. Uh, that'll be absolutely fascinating. And at some stage, Along the way, we're going to allow people to ask questions and we'll give you a way of actually doing that, of either emailing them in or we might even do a program where we'll allow the questions live and try to interact, but we'll sort out that technology at some stage in the future. And uh, Dr. Jensen, uh, just thank you again. This has been absolutely fascinating and my brain is now filled and overfilled. Uh, with all of this information, but people are fascinated by history and this will all be in a book that you're going to publish in 2021. So this is the research leading up to that. So people are getting all the foundational work here and then the details will be in that book in 2021. Okay. Look forward to seeing you for episodes 21 and 22.